Well, um, this morning we are going to jump into a new series, new teaching series for Sunday for the month of November. Uh, but uh, I, I want to start with something that I think maybe a few of you can identify with. Um, I have been pain averse for as long as I can remember. Do you know what I, you know what I mean here? Um, pain is kind of this thing, I will do anything to avoid pain. Um, what do I have to do to avoid pain? pain. That's, ask, ask Ruthie, she will tell you. That's, whatever it is, I don't want to be hurting. That's just the way that I, I roll. So um, one of my earliest attempts uh, to avoid pain uh, was due to my frequent encounters with bullies. Anybody in here had to deal with bullies growing up? Okay. Maybe even still now at work, you know what I'm talking about? Anybody, you know? I remember once being so terrified of a bully that I stayed around after school ended, thinking if I stayed at school long enough, the bully would go home. Guess what the bully did? She waited until I was done with school, until I came out, and then she beat me up anyway. At around the age of 10, I struggled also to cope with the pressure of being a good kid. I didn't want to give my single mom any trouble. I was trying to be a good kid at home. I was trying to be a good kid at school, at church, everywhere. And as you probably know, bullies are pretty good at finding people like that, right? All of that led to me being admitted to Cook County Hospital in Chicago, Illinois, at the age of 10, diagnosed with ulcers. Pain, pain. How do I avoid pain? You may or may not be familiar with a group of individuals from the Old Testament of your Bible who are known as the patriarchs. There are three people in particular who carry that title, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Uh, Abraham's son is Isaac. Isaac's son is Jacob. And they lived in what's called the patriarchal age. If you read through their lives and the lives of the people they're around, it it is very, very uh, difficult uh, to avoid reading about their challenges, their, their hardships, their pain. Yet their stories changed the course of human history. I've wondered if God in his infinite wisdom insist that pain in this life be part of the process that purifies us from the inside out. This teaching series that we're going to start is called Leadership Pain because the fact of the matter is quite simply this. I believe God has called each of us to lead in some way and in some place leadership at its most basic, is influence we have on others. We are leaders in our homes, in our jobs, in our schools. Here's the truth. Wherever you lead, wherever that may be, whenever you lead, it will produce growth and change. And that change will lead to loss. And loss will lead to pain. There's a man by the name of San Chan, and he wrote a book called Growth Equals Pain. Leadership is pain. We have an incredible example of the pain that comes from the leadership in the story of Old Testament patriarch Jacob. He was a leader who literally, not just figuratively, literally, had pain because of his leadership. If you don't know it, Jacob led with a limp. He had a literal limp. The question today that I want you all to answer is, what will you lead with? You know, Jacob comes to us from the pages of Scripture, and it's easy to see why he has the issues that he does and how his leadership pain made him into the person that he was, and what 
all of us what we can learn from this. Here's the first thing that we can learn. The deceiver is deceived. Let me set this up for you. Reading through uh, several chapters of the book of Genesis, we're introduced to this patriarch, Jacob. When he was born, he was grasping the heel of his brother. Now, I know that sounds kind of incredulous, right? Incredible, but it's true. He was grasping the heel of his brother. As a matter of fact, his father prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife, Rebekah, because she was childless. The Lord answered his prayer, and Rebekah became pregnant. The babies jostled within her, and she said, why is this happening to me? Any moms out there can identify with me? What's going on with me? So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, two nations are in your womb, and two peoples from within you will be separated. One people will be stronger than the other, and the older will serve the younger. When the time came for her to give birth, there were twin boys in her womb. I love this description. The first to come out was red, and his whole body was like a hairy garment. So they named him Esau. After this, his brother came out with his hand grasping Esau's heel. So he was named Jacob. Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Anybody in here 60 years old would love to have twins? So Isaac was 60 years old when Rebekah gave birth to them. Pastor Michael, you're not 60, right? right? No, you're not okay. I know Pastor Michael's, you know, Jessica, they're expecting that. You're not 60, though. Well, just for clarification's sake, the name Jacob. The name Jacob literally means to grasp the heel. It's actually a, a Hebrew expression, expression for the word deceiver. But the story of Jacob takes an even more intriguing turn as he grows older, as Jacob matures. The sibling rivalry between him and his older brother. Anybody here got a brother or sister that you kind of go back and forth with a little bit? Yeah, okay. There's a, you know, yeah, just a, 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 some of us do, right? Esau, this, this whole thing kind of intensifies between he and Esau. One day we read that Jacob manages to convince Esau, his older brother, to relinquish or give up his birthright. And this birthright is some, it's, it's a right or a privilege that belonged to the firstborn son in a Hebrew family. The eldest son held the highest rank after the father, and in the father's absence, had the father's authority and responsibility. And Jacob manipulated his brother into giving up his birthright. What we do is we read over in Genesis chapter 25, when Esau returns from hunting, he'd been out hunting all day, and he was starving, he was famished, And he met his brother, came across his brother who was cooking a meal, and he asked him for a bowl of soup. And Jacob offered him the bowl of soup in exchange for his birthright privileges. At this point, Esau, the the writer in Genesis gives a little parenthetical note and says that Esau despised his birthright and everything it represented. He surrendered it to Jacob thereby initiating a decades-long dysfunctional family relationship that would take years to be resolved. A few chapters later, Genesis chapter 27, when Jacob and Esau's father, Isaac, is on his deathbed preparing to die, as was customary, he is ready to pronounce that birthright blessing on the oldest son, which should have been Esau, right? However, in a scheme that was orchestrated by his mother, Rebecca Jacob, deceives his own father. Guys, this is whacked. He deceived his own father, pretending to be Esau, in order to receive that birthright blessing. Later, after hunting again, Esau comes in to receive the blessing from Isaac. And he's informed, it's too late. It's too late. I, I, you can't receive the blessing. 
I've already given it away to your younger brother, Jacob. Now, time out. <clears throat> I just want to pause here for a second. Because I firmly believe that these stories that come to us from these chapters in the Old Testament book of Genesis clearly indicate, there's no question about it, Jacob was intentional. Jacob was purposeful. He knew exactly what he wanted. He knew how to obtain it. And you know what? That's a critical aspect of being a leader. Both, all of those things. A sense of clarity, sense of purpose, mission, intention. On the other hand, another thing that comes pretty evident is that Jacob's inclination towards deception will ultimately cause havoc in his relationships with family members and those in the region that he lives in. And this is, too, part of leadership pain that goes unnoticed, but it's tragically real. And now this story about leadership pain, it takes a really sharp turn, the kind of turn wherein Jacob's leadership catches up to him. Jacob's tricked into a marriage he didn't want. Now, guys, I've read this story for years from the book of Genesis, and I've always thought Jacob was an idiot, well, especially around this issue. But he was tricked into a marriage. He didn't want this. He didn't want to be married to the person that he was married. And so in Genesis chapter 29, Jacob makes up his mind to leave his home. He should because he's deceived his brother, taken something that he really shouldn't have. And so now he pretty much runs away from Esau. He moves to another part away from that furious brother. And in this new region, he, he finds work for one of his uncles, his uncle Laban. And while he's there, he meets this beautiful young woman, falls head over heels in love with her. And so he strikes this seven-year working arrangement with his uncle, agreeing to work for his uncle for seven years in exchange for the right to marry Rachel. Now, guys, that's a lot of love. You know, there's a lot of things I would do for Ruthie. I don't know that if her dad had said, well, you got to come be my associate pastor for seven years, then you can marry Ruthie. I don't know. I just said, no thanks. Sorry. But Jacob agrees to work for seven years for his uncle. Jacob discovers that after seven years and the following morning of the wedding, that he has been tricked, actually, into marrying Rachel's older sister, Leah. And guess what he has to do now in order to marry Rachel? Because he's married to Leah, he can't get out of it. You know what he has to do now? Seven more years. Fourteen years this man works, drives, so that he can marry Rachel. It's clear, folks, that Jacob is a deceiver who's been deceived and his whole life is one filled with deception. But he's also, he is also a person who is quite clear what he wants. He's intentional. He's purposeful. His, de his, his, his deception, though, his, his being a deceiver, it leads to dis disputed and awkward and damaged relationships. But there's another part to the story, as Paul Harvey used to say. There's the rest of the story. Suddenly, everything seems to change because the deceiver is disabled. Jacob has now come into his own wealth. After multiple years of service to his uncle Laban, he has multiple wives, he's grown these flocks of animals, He's managed to expand his influence, his power, yet at his heart, Jacob remains a deceiver. He ultimately ends up running away from his uncle. In Genesis chapter 31, Jacob makes the decision, okay, I'm going to run away from my uncle, but he's going to run toward his brother Esau. What captivates me the most about this is Jacob's 
nonstop thinking about what the next step should be, just intentional, purposeful. The impact that he has on countless people across an entire region of the world that he lives in. It's undeniable as well that Jacob carries a significant internal distortion about himself. However, his days of deceitfully walking away from the damage he's caused to others seem to be drawing to a close. We read these words witnessing his encounter with a man in Genesis at chapter 32. Pastor Bryce read it for us a little bit early, but I think it's important that we hear this again. That night, this is the night before he's to meet his brother who he's been estranged from for years. That night, Jacob rose, gathered his two wives, two female servants, and 11 sons, and he crossed the ford of the Jabbok River. After ensuring their safe passage across the stream, he sent all his possessions behind him. Consequently, Jacob found himself alone and engaged in a wrestling match with a man until dawn. When the man realized he couldn't overpower Jacob, he touched the socket of his hip, causing it to be wrenched during their struggle. The man then requested, let me go, for it's daybreak. However, Jacob refused to release him unless he received a blessing. The man, the man inquired about Jacob's name, to which he replied, Jacob. The man then declared, your name will no longer be Jacob, but Israel, for you have struggled with God. Humans, and still you've emerged victorious. Jacob persisted in asking for the man's name, but he responded, why do you ask my name? Before revealing his name, the man blessed Jacob. Jacob named the place Peniel, meaning it is because I saw God face to face, and yet my life was spared. And as he passed Peniel, the sun rose above him, and he limped due to the injury to his hip. This is just a parenthetical note, but I do think it's important. A lot of people, a lot of places you'll read and different accounts about what's gone on here, that Jacob wrestled with an angel. That's not what the text says. What did the text say? He wrestled with what? He wrestled with a man. Who is the man of God from the Bible? Who, who would that be? Anybody want? It's Jesus. This is the pre-incarnate form of the Son of God who's come to visit Jacob, to wrestle with Jacob, to refine, I think, Jacob from the inside out through this injury. In an instant, Jacob's life, his identity, undergoes this transformative change. Because prior to this encounter, he undoubtedly possessed considerable skills and manipulation, self-centeredness. He was a negotiator. He was calculating. He knew how to evade the consequences of his actions. Folks, these are all now to be viewed in a different light. His very identity has changed. This God-given limp, this new name, Israel, will alter the course of his life, that of his family, for generations to come. There's a guy by the name of Dan Allender. And he rightly points this out. He says, this limp that Jacob acquires, it serves as a reminder that when God renames us, he also transforms us, each of us, into a new person through a process of redemption that necessitates vulnerability. Furthermore, I want to recognize the significance of the new name that God bestows on not just Jacob, but on us. There's a power in a name. <laughs> and there is this thing called nominative determinism. How many of you have heard of nominative determinism? Raise your hand. Nominative determinism. Well, it was actually coined by a professor from New York University. And he says that this term literally means name-driven outcome. Name-driven outcome. 
And really, it highlights this profound influence that comes to us and shapes us, many times based on our name. He gives some pretty compelling examples to kind of support that notion. For instance, consider the former Chief Justice of England and Wales, Justice Igor Judge. Now, y'all are going to think I'm making that up. I looked these names up. Igor Judge, his technical name is Lord Justice Laws. He had a colleague, though. His colleague's name was Lord Justice Laws. <laughs> that, was, that was someone he served on the bench with in the Court of Appeals. But there's also, this shows up in the realm of athletic pursuits. Did you know that? How many of you have ever heard of Anna Smashnova? She was a professional Israeli tennis player. Ever heard of her? Or how about Lane Beachley, who was a seven-time world champion surfer? Or there's also Derek Kicklick, who was an Australian rules football player. And Stephen Robotham, an Olympic rower for Britain. They bear the impact of their name in their achievements. Anybody ever heard of Usain Bolt? Usain Bolt is still the current fastest man in the world. He holds the title of fastest man in the world for over 100 meters and 200 meter distances. I wonder if that's partly connected to that name, Usain Bolt. Beyond those examples, there's some other people. Daniel Snowman, who wrote a book about the Arctic and Antarctica. There's Christopher Koch, who was a notorious Jamaican drug dealer. And Dr. A.J. Splatt, who was a doctor of urology. You know, <laughs> these folks have names that kind of have left a mark on their respective fields. And so you have to ask yourself, are these coincidences? For instance, maybe Usain Bolt wouldn't run at the same speed if his name was Usain Plod, right? This is what Dr. Alter concludes. He says, researchers have demonstrated that our names deeply resonate within our mental realms, exerting a magnetic pull toward the concepts they represent. Jacob becomes Israel, one who wrestles with God. He was asked by GQ magazine some best advice. And Nick Nolte said this. He, he suggested that accepting defeat is one of the most profound acts we can make and we can take. Our culture often views losing as what? That's not a good thing, right? But it's through those losses that we grow. We change. Winning doesn't guarantee growth, but our culture glorifies victory. Accepting defeat is actually the antithesis of everything we've ever been taught in this culture. Friends, sometimes our greatest losses become our most significant teachers. I don't advocate for striving for loss or making it kind of a constant thing you just do, look for. Winning is absolutely rewarding, but a fair share of losses is essential for personal progress. They, they teach us acceptance, humility, the art of finding happiness. And I dare say they shape us into the leaders that we are. And I want to leave you with this helpful reminder Whenever you lead, it will produce growth and change. That change will lead to loss. And loss <laughs> will lead to pain. But as has been said, growth equals pain. Leadership is pain. Would you pray with me? God, we are grateful for this picture that comes to us from your word about Jacob. Lord, he absolutely changed the world that he lived in. He impacted the lives of so many. And God, it is from Jacob that the nation of Israel came into existence. That struggle with you. 
And God, as we seek to be people who impact the lives of others, may we do so in a way recognizing that it's probably going to be painful. But God, that is part of what it means to be used by you to accomplish your purposes. May we, even in the midst of whatever pain we experience, may we look to you remembering that you are with us and you will never lead us. We pray this in your son's name. Amen. 